Hello and welcome to the Asian Society of International Law 101, a space where we discuss international law scholarship from Asia, about Asia and international law scholarship in general. So hello everyone. For today's podcast held by Asian Society of International Law, we are delighted to have Professor Simon Chesterman from Singapore National University School of Law. He is also Senior Director of AI Governance at AI Singapore. Professor Chesterman had just published a book titled We the Robot from Cambridge University Press. And today we'll talk with him about some of the important questions that his book offers. I am Michael Megro from University of Amsterdam, and I also happen to be a policymaker from a government on international rulemaking of go- data governance and uh, relevant technologies like AI in my different hat. I will be the interlocutor of the podcast today. So Professor Chesterman, we're very happy to have you today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Thank you. So let's begin with an overview of the book. So Professor Chesterman's new book, We the Robots, offers novel observation on the challenges posed by increasing deployment of AI, artificial intelligence, and how to cope with them through the means of law, in particular international law. He also shed the light to the question pertaining to the ongoing process of AI, replacing regulatory activities to cope with automation and the speeded up societal system by AI. So Professor Chesterman, Please tell us about the very motivation of your book, tackling the question pertaining to regulating AI. Thanks. So, I mean, basically through most of my career, I've been interested in trying to understand how public authority deals with crisis or limit situations. Uh, So I did my doctorate on humanitarian intervention, what international law could or should do when a state turns on its own population. Uh, My next major work was on post-conflict reconstruction, what role the international community could play in a situation where the public institutions of authority had either collapsed or or been wiped away. Uh, Then I looked at counterterrorism situations, how a state should react to a a situation where non-traditional threats threatened its ability to lead. Uh, And it seems pretty clear that technology is going in that kind of direction, not not necessarily uh, presenting an immediate sort of physical threat, uh, but it really does challenge the way in which we think about public authority, regulation in that sense of public control, meaning that there is a sphere of activities with potential enormous benefit uh, for a population, but also some risks. And what can and should public authority do to mitigate those risks so that we get the benefits while minimizing the harms? Um, And so an important dimension of this, obviously, is the national level. And much of the book looks at the challenges to national authority uh, when most legal systems presume that either humans or corporations are the main actors and that we can understand the motivation for those actions uh, and uh, and do so all at a reasonable time. Uh, And technology, in particular AI, poses a challenge in in three ways. First, just through its speed, uh, things are happening faster than most regulators know how to deal with it. Um, Secondly, Um, autonomous systems um, take decisions or appear to take decisions for themselves, who's responsible for those? Uh, And then thirdly, um, machine learning systems are often increasingly opaque, so it's very hard to understand how and why a decision is made in the first place. So all of this poses a real challenge to domestic actors. But the international dimension, something I thought maybe I could bring to bear on this question, um, really arose from the challenge that even if one state regulates all of this in a a meaningful, effective way, uh, technology is global. The internet is global. uh, And it's entirely possible uh, that um, uh, something that takes place in one jurisdiction won't be able to be contained within that jurisdiction, that much like a computer virus can go global very quickly. Uh, The idea that artificial intelligence systems will remain local uh, is probably uh, a bit naive. Uh, and so that's why I, I crafted the book. It um, should do the shameless advertising just so people can that's see the cover. Uh, and hopefully it's of interest. Hopefully it's a useful contribution to this debate, though certainly it's not going to be the last word. Well, thank you so much. Actually, when I was reading your book, I was very much impressed, especially it provides a framework that can give a structure to the regulator's thinking and framing the right question that regulators really should ask. 
you know, regulators, regulators are facing a lot of questions on a daily basis. So this book helps to kind of frame the question out of broad, almost shapeless, like sprawling out debates from normative to practical layers that generally and collectively sort of dumped it on the regulators. While, like you mentioned, challenges of AI such as speed, autonomy, or opaqueness of the system is rather emitment and requires to act with a delay. And at the same time, your book also curves out very interesting question that academic can also discuss, especially in terms of drawing the limit in shaping regulations or institutional choices that can be tackled from political theories, like you mentioned in your book, or to my mind, also legal theories in the sense that it also deal with the joint of law and society or law and humanity perhaps. And each political community would have distinct particularities in how they handle this question, like you just mentioned. So this brings me to another question to you. I would also like to hear more about your approach in the book, particularly with the current situation where the regulatory approaches to AI is quite diverse across the communities. While, like you said in your book, regulating AI cannot be a meaningful one if one state to confront it alone? So, uh, I mean, I suppose one way in which I carve up the regulatory challenge is what are you trying to achieve? Uh, and most jurisdictions around the world, uh, including at the international level, are trying to um, minimise avoidable harm without unnecessarily constraining innovation. And that's a real challenge. Uh, and we have plenty of examples of that. Um, if you go back to the George W. Bush administration in the United States, took a hard line on stem cell research back in, I think, 2001. Uh, and that was driven by arguably valid moral concerns that they didn't want to pursue stem cell research. The main consequence was stem cell research just moved to other jurisdictions. Uh, and so I think many, many countries are wary of that, wary of unnecessarily constraining innovation. Uh, and so... Another thing that I hope that the book offers is different lenses through which to view the challenges, the, the problems that you're trying to avoid. Um, and so I carve up sort of into three separate areas, uh, the, the, the types of um, goal one might have as a regulator. So in some areas, for example, all you really want is the best outcome. You want to optimize. Um, you can look at something through a utilitarian lens. Uh, so how do we get the benefits while mitigating the harms? Uh, and so if you think of autonomous vehicles, for example, we want autonomous vehicles to be safe. Uh, if you think about sort of drones uh, or other sort of transportation systems, you want to get the benefits, uh, which could be considerable. I mean, a million people a year die every year uh, on, uh, on the roads, uh, mostly due to human error. Um, anytime an autonomous vehicle crashes, it's front page news. Uh, and at the moment, clearly there are issues to be worked out, but eventually autonomous vehicles might be safer than human-driven vehicles. And to me, that's the main question. How do you, through a utilitarian lens, get the benefits, mitigate the harms? But there are other questions where it's not as simple as a utilitarian calculus. Uh, and sometimes there are moral questions which we grapple with, not just to get the best outcome, but because they're important moral questions that should be grappled with. And probably the clearest example of this is lethal autonomous weapons. Most people, not all, but most people, I think, have a visceral sense uh, that it is immoral uh, to hand over to a machine the individualized determination in a battlefield environment of who gets to live and who gets to die. Uh, and what's interesting when you drill down into this is some people will argue, oh, a machine can never make as good of decisions on the battlefield as a soldier. And I think that's a pretty hard argument to sustain. Most, I mean, I've interned at the War Crimes Tribunal for Rwanda in the past. Most war crimes don't happen because um, people were mistaken. Most war crimes happen because they were either um, racist or sexist or angry or tired or frustrated. Uh, and these are precisely the things that machines uh, meant to be able to avoid. Uh, and so there's an argument if machines were doing the fighting, there'd be far fewer mistakes, far less racism, sexism and so on. Uh, and so you can make a serious argument that a machine will be more compliant with the laws of war. Uh, nonetheless, many of us would still think, and indeed the International Committee of the Red Cross argues, and I agree with them, uh, that these decisions should be made by humans, not because the human will make the better decision, but because the human has the moral framework 
to grapple with it and has the ability to be held accountable for it. So that's a second type of um, challenge, which uh, if the first is utilitarian, the second is deontological, that is non-consequentialist. We, we argue that it's a moral question, not just to be evaluated by comparing means and ends, uh, but by looking at what is inherently right. Uh, and then a third category, I think, is the extent to which governments should be allowed to outsource their activities. Uh, and we've seen this increasingly in, in many jurisdictions. Governments, obviously, it's helpful if you can automate certain systems. And in some situations, um, a machine will produce a more consistent, more reliable decision. And if it's a matter of arithmetic, that's fine. But if it's a matter of determining the rights and benefits uh, that go to an individual, maybe we should have some pause. Uh, again, because the legitimacy of that decision isn't, or at least isn't only because it's right, because it's objectively correct, it's also legitimate because of the person who's making the decision. Uh, and there, probably the clearest example is that of the judge, uh, where if a judge makes a determination about guilt and innocence, uh, and then uh, explains this by saying, well, my internal statistical methodology says that with 95% certainty, X is guilty, most of us would reject that. Uh, we want to hear the reasons, we want to understand the reasons, and the, the decision is legitimate, not because of the objective correctness, but because that person, that decision-making structure exists within a political system with some sort of accountability structure to be held accountable for it. So again, hopefully that's something that the book offers in terms of understanding the regulatory challenge that public authorities face around the world. Definitely. I mean, your book is really helpful in the sense that you really provide the lenses to really look into such a complicated and in a way inflated concept and whole phenomenon of artificial intelligence. That is a great value of this book. That's my opinion. But could you tell us more, a little more about why this is international law that can help in the sense that you have just explained? Because from the, I, from the perspective of regulators or policymakers, perhaps like regulatory cooperation can take many other way than sort of law in a hard sense like regulatory dialogues between the likely-minded countries or something like Western arrangement on the export control for the conventional weapon can be another example. Or like you mentioned in the book, the regimes like GPAI on AI or IPCC on climate change. But among all these possible models, why international law offers something in this context that you have just explained? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a huge believer in international law. I think it's played a, a vital role in stopping us from destroying the planet and each other. Um, but I'm quite modest about what it can and should do here uh, because, candidly, most of the work actually will be in the self-regulation space. The, and this is true of many spheres of activity, but especially in research, um, the greatest restraint on behaviour is self-restraint. Uh, and so I think there's a lot to do on self-regulation and part of the book talks about that. The next level, national regulation, I think that's also very important. Uh, but going back to what we were describing earlier, uh, in the absence of international coordination, at least, and I would argue at least a few red lines, um, all of this will be ineffective because it'll be so easy to get around. Um, and so as I was looking at the international environment, I mean, there's clearly various areas in which international law has played a role in restraining potentially um, um, bad behavior. Uh, and you can look at things like chemical biological weapons. You can look at the treatment of things like child sex tourism and uh, matters like that. You can look at um, trade in, uh, in endangered species. And there are all sorts of examples that one could look at where we try and engage in collective action. But actually the one that I thought was the most compelling uh, actually is to compare um, the technology we've, we've identified today, which is potentially uh, of enormous benefit, but also of enormous harm. Uh, and that, to me, led me back 70 years or so, or 80 years almost, to the, uh, to the emergence of nuclear energy. Uh, and there, what I found fascinating was the early days of the debates over how we could get the benefits of nuclear energy while mitigating the risks. And the book includes a kind of thought experiment, saying, well, okay, what could we do? What could uh, encourage international coordination? Uh, and so I take the, the, the initial dream of what the International Atomic Energy Agency was meant to be uh, and then try and apply it to AI. Mm -hmm. And so the theory basically is that if you go back to even the early, in the early 1940s, the scientists 
who were uh, identifying the potential of nuclear energy, potential benefits as well as destruction, they were aware that the risks uh, that came with this technology were great. Uh, and that's a striking thing if you leap forward to today. It's, it's entirely common to see uh, people warning about the dangers of technology and so on. But some of the most strident warnings about the potential threat of AI, in particular artificial general intelligence, these are coming from experts in the field uh, or people who should know the field very well, people like Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Stephen Hawking, and so on. Um, and so that was one parallel. Uh, and in terms of what the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, was meant to achieve, it seemed like an interesting kind of um, grand bargain, where the idea at least was that you had countries with technology um, that they wanted to share with others in exchange for a promise that this technology would be used for good rather than for ill. Uh, and so as a result, you had the International Atomic Energy Agency, you had Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace speech to the UN, uh, you had ultimately the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, and so you had this idea, um, not ever fully realized, but the idea that nuclear energy would play this role in having electricity too cheap to meter, it would transform medicine, agriculture, and so on. Some of this has happened. Um, clearly, nuclear energy remains uh, a bit controversial in some areas, but it's one of very few serious short-term alternatives to hydrocarbons. Um, but in medicine, in agriculture, uh, nuclear technology has been, uh, has been revolutionary. And although the threat of nuclear war remains, it is shocking, it is amazing in a very positive way uh, that despite thousands of nuclear weapons around the world, none has been used in anger since 1945 and the horrific attacks on Japan. Uh, and so I thought, well, could we apply this to um, artificial intelligence? Uh, and the challenge is in what circumstances would countries give up the right or the ability to use this technology? You can understand countries wanting the free technology transfer, but what should be the red lines? What should be the things on which uh, we should draw a hard limit and say, we're not going to go there? Um, and I tried to limit it down to the minimum and came down with two. Um, so the first is human control, that we should maintain a hard line on human control of this technology, that you should, it should be illegal to develop uh, weapons that go, uh, to develop systems that go beyond human control, either narrowly in the sense of a lethal autonomous weapon that can't be controlled by a human, that has a human out of the loop, um, or more generally in the sense of artificial general intelligence. Uh, and that remain science fiction at the moment, uh, but as we sort of progress through the years and decades, that might become more realistic. So that's one red line, that there should be human control uh, and it should be illegal to develop uh, either a weapon or a system that is impossible for us to control. Uh, and then the second, and this goes to the questions of accountability, of explainability, is a minimum threshold of transparency, uh, that there should always be, if you like, a kind of breadcrumb going back from an, auto an uh, AI system to an individual who's either the, the owner, the user, or the manufacturer, uh, the owner, the producer, or the, the uh, no, sorry, the owner, the user, or the manufacturer uh, of, that, uh, of that system. Uh, and if we can maintain these two basic principles of control, human control and transparency, uh, then the rest of the regulatory framework should work out. Uh, but these, these limits will only work if they're global. Uh, because otherwise it'd be too easy for jurisdictions to, to cheat, to free ride, uh, and to get around them. Uh, so that's what I think the international dimension has to offer. Certainly. So what you mean by global red line in your book is basically only about human control and transparency, or do you mean something beyond, like some, something more substantial saying that should be internationalized or institutionalized at the international level? So oh, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I'm actually quite wary of too much international interference. I mean, I, I, I'm a big admirer of the International Telecommunications Union, uh, what used to be the International Telegraph Union, one of the oldest international organizations. Um, but when, it was, when some people were mooting the idea that it should control the internet, uh, I was among those thinking it was a terrible idea um, because what international regulation can do uh, if it becomes intrusive, is it reduces things to a lowest common denominator. And if you had to get global agreement on what could take place on the internet, uh, then I don't think the internet would be what it is today. Uh, so I, I, I'm persuaded by the kind of arguments for decentralization, uh, at least with regard, with regard to much of technology. Uh, and so that's why I say that 
Um, the, the International Atomic Energy Agency, I think, remains an interesting example because it's got a very clear, narrow mandate to promote positive uses of nuclear energy uh, and to try and stop weaponization or any other use of nuclear energy. And so I think that kind of focused mandate uh, is one, um, not necessarily secret to its success, but I think it's at least that, that clarity of mission has been helpful. And you, you could also compare with other organizations like uh, in the area of biological weapons, chemical weapons, and so on. Um, but I don't see this as being an area where you want, for example, the General Assembly to be opining on an annual basis on what AI could or should be doing. The General Assembly, for example, might have a role in, in general um, policy frameworks, in making recommendations. The Security Council could conceivably get involved in the, in the event when, not if, probably, uh, and indeed, there's an argument that lethal autonomous weapons have already been deployed on the battlefield in 2020. Uh, so you can imagine the Security Council playing a role. Um, but I do think international law often functions best when it has a narrow, clear mandate with, with real buy-in from member states uh, and, and other stakeholders. Uh, and when it spreads itself too thin, uh, when, it, when it oversteps um, its boundaries, uh, then the legitimacy gets called into question. Uh, and maybe that's an example where I can highlight the role of the Security Council that in particular over the last 20 years since September 11, 2001, the Security Council mandate expanded. In, indeed, it was already expanding through the 1990s. Uh, and I was part of a process that, that looked at the legitimacy of the Council. And one of the key checks on the authority of the Council, on the legitimacy of, of the Council, is just member state willingness to comply. Because uh, there's no court that sits in formal judgment of the Security Council, but the members of the Security Council, I think, are acutely aware that, and I think it was the late David Caron who said this, Security Council resolutions without member state support are just wishful thinking. So international institutions, because of the unusual hierarchy of international law, the anarchical society that Hedley Bull wrote of, uh, International institutions must be peculiarly aware of the limits of their own legitimacy uh, and, again, function best when they function on the basis of a, a clear mandate with a clear mission and clear buy-in from its stakeholders. Thank you so much. I definitely agree with your point about clear and narrow mandate of international law and also other instruments. Because obviously we have seen the global frustration rises against what appears to be the inability of international institutions, particularly with wide and general competence, to solve the global challenges of our time. And even putting beside what exactly the course of stalemate in this kind of multilateral treaty organs or international institution, consequence of frustration is basically the rise of populist populist or nation nationalist movements that turn into the reduced scope for international cooperation. And like you said, this may also apply to the ongoing discussion of artificial intelligence or underlying data as their training resources speaking under the international framework, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I should emphasize that I'm, I'm a big fan of having lots of discussion about these things. So I'm not saying that there shouldn't be lots more partnerships, lots more forums for discussion. But if you're talking about actual hard regulatory roles, then yeah, I think I do think those should be limited. Uh, and I would also be wary of going down the path. Uh, one one organisation you mentioned, the Global Partnership on AI (GPAI), where um, uh, I don't think any of this is controversial. The US was long a, a holdout uh, until it uh, got assurance that if it joined, China would be excluded. Uh, and to me, that's the kind of antithesis of a global response. That's really a um, that that raises the, the specter of a kind of divided internet, divided technology, which, which I think could encourage an arms race and all sorts of other adverse effects. Certainly. Well, that's quite interesting observation, which is sort of fragmented approaches already start appearing at the level of international space in terms of effort of, kind of having a common framework on the topic of AI. Well, I'm kind of wondering because when we think about, when we discuss about this red line talk, should we find this kind of common basis in the instrument which is unique to international relations or international law, or should we find a certain common template 
which is designed from the domestic legal system of which you envisage as perhaps leading player, such as United States, European Union, China, or Singapore that were actually also mentioned in your book. What do you think about this question actually? Yeah, so, uh, so in this area, I think international law should uh, complement rather than seek to replace national legislation. Um, and I mean, I, th I think at the moment we're engaged in a great regulatory experiment, uh, and that's common at an early stage of technology. And I mentioned um, stem cells. There are other examples, uh, recombinant, GNA, uh, recombinant DNA technology, gene splicing, as it was called from the 1970s, chemical biological weapons. This is quite common um, to have a, a degree of regulatory experimentation. Uh, we've, in, in the technology sphere, we've also seen things like data protection law, where there's different regimes around the world, and then things coalesce on a kind of standard, and you've got regulatory uh, leaders like uh, the European Union, which set a standard, and it's a sufficiently big economy and influential enough political system uh, that it sort of disseminates out around the world. Uh, in this area, um, I do think um, if we had some sort of international benchmark, uh, again, the comparison with nuclear energy maybe is telling that what you need is the international coordination rather than dictate. That's why I'm not saying the Security Council should just pass a resolution and force countries to behave. Ideally, what you would have is some sort of international instrument to agree on these red lines uh, to be enforced by member states then enacting them domestically. Uh, because enforcement, uh, I don't think it's realistic to have sort of global police traveling the world, looking for rogue AI systems like some Blade Runner vision of the future. Uh, rather, what I think you want is the international community to set these standards, which are then enforced locally, because that'll be much more effective. Uh, although even then, I mean, I confess that, that the analogy with nuclear energy is a little bit strained, uh, because nuclear energy is a pretty defined set of technologies. It relies on materials that are finite, uh, and only a handful of countries have access to them. Whereas the threshold of getting into AI uh, is quite low uh, and uh, there's no limited resources, uh, at least not, not in theory, uh, and, uh, and the, the, the threshold to entry therefore is quite low. So AI will be a lot harder to contain. It's also, also a lot harder to detect uh, than, than uh, radioactive materials. Uh, nonetheless, I think if we could get to some sort of agreed standard, uh, then maybe like nuclear energy, um, there are many countries um, around the world that have the capacity to make nuclear weapons that choose not to. Uh, and so, again, it's kind of a, a pleasant, it would be a pleasant surprise to people from the 1940s and 50s, not only how, how few, or the fact that we haven't used nuclear weapons in anger since 45, but also how few countries actually have nuclear weapons, given that it is such old technology today. Uh, and that's only possible with the combination of an international agreement, national um, um, governance, uh, plus a general community standard that most countries don't have nuclear weapons, not because of the fear of punishment, but because it never crosses their mind that it'd be a useful thing for them to have. Thank you so much. Exactly. Uh, the nature of AI and nature of nuclear weapon is slightly different in the sense that how broad the system or this technology can be used in the society and also how deeply this can be integrated to the daily life of people. So in your book, there's another key theme, which is using AI in regulating AI. That's also a huge topic, which we have to tackle quite hard. So the term low tech or reg tech is definitely hype. It, it definitely is determining hype globally. And as you rightly mentioned, certain parts of executing regulation or even dispute settlements are increasingly relying on the processing power of computers artificial intelligence and other disruptive technologies like blockchain smart contract. So on this topic, I definitely agree with your observation in the book that certain features of AI system represent a sort of shift of power away from the state or public authority. And I think many would agree that effective using AI in combination with other disruptive technology is qualitatively different from the previous generation of digitalization like electric contract or electric applications because technology can play similar function to the organs of public authorities like regulators or judges. So this is I think similar to the privatization debates going on decades but what is different from privatization is relying on automating technologies 
would reshape the underlying assumption on the concept about how the public authority execute the law and regulation, or even the underlying concept about rule of law. So in this regard, you, I think in the last part of your book, you delineate that certain technology should be regulated by design or should be equipped with self debugging features. But beyond these kind of product safety standards, there is also another question, which is what is inherently human function in the public authority for a political community or for the global level? Otherwise, regulator cannot really explain that why they have to bind themselves not to use certain possibly useful technologies as a matter of public procurement. So I would really appreciate if you could share your thoughts on how you would advise the readers of this book in the governments to help them think, giving a structure to, to their thinking in order to tackle this very difficult question at the national level. Yeah, so, um, so the, the, the simplest answer uh, is the kind of visceral one. So there are certain government functions where, and if you think of sort of um, determination of rights and obligations, the use of the coercive powers of the state, these would seem to be things that are generally regarded as inherently governmental. Uh, and that's the language that's used in the US, but I think in most jurisdictions, um, there is an idea of why we vote for people, why the people we vote for have certain powers while they're in office and so on. And so if you go through a thought experiment, if that minister or that president wanted to outsource something, could they outsource their discretion to a private company that would make decisions based on profit? And if the answer to that is no, then that's probably the kind of decision you shouldn't be outsourcing to an algorithm that is opaque and autonomous either. Um, so that's a kind of glib answer that you shouldn't be able to outsource to a machine what you couldn't outsource to a company or to a foreign entity, for example. And that, that for most people will answer many, many questions. But the more detailed question implicit in your really interesting comment and question is what is it about these decisions that makes them different? Um, so no one, for example, would say it should be illegal for a judge to use a calculator. Uh, and that she or he must do long division by hand. I mean, that'd be crazy. Uh, but most of us would have a fear or at least a reservation about him or her making sentencing decisions based purely on an algorithm that they can't explain. So they feed in the information and it spits it out. Uh, and there are lawsuits on this. Uh, and, and we could talk about the Loomis case from the US and, and others. But the, the broader point that you make about law uh, and the limits of AI systems and maybe I'll talk about the limits and the benefits. The limits of AI systems in law, and this is something I like to explain to the law students in National University of Singapore, where I'm the dean, and they're all worried about getting replaced by robots. Um, and I reassure them that they're not going to get, or at least they won't all be replaced by robots, uh, because law is inherently um, antagonistic and, and agonistic, that if law, if legal uh, decisions were able to be reduced to equations, if they were able to be reduced to mere probabilities, um, then parties wouldn't go to court. Uh, because if, at the moment, if you think of most litigation, most litigation uh, involves highly paid lawyers uh, coming to different conclusions and then arguing it out in front of a, a third person who makes a final conclusion. Uh, and indeed, if, it, if there were a clear answer in these cases, they wouldn't waste their money going to court. They would, they would reach that rational answer themselves. So the idea that a computer can simply replace all of that and, and make better decisions, uh, I think, is, is wrong, um, mainly because the legal question can't be reduced to a simple equation. Um, and that goes to the nature of law. It's also the nature of the legal process that computers are very good at the moment, the sort of machine learning systems that we're implicitly describing are very good at extrapolating from past data, but essentially they're not really making uh, new decisions. What they're doing is making predictions based on the past. So probably the clearest example of this is understanding the weather. So we've got lots of data about the weather. Uh, and although weather is a little bit more unpredictable these days because of uh, climate emergency, for the most part, given a sufficient amount of data, we can predict at least what the weather will be like tomorrow. Um, and that's fine if you're primarily backward looking and you're primarily based on basing your um, analysis on, okay, in these circumstances, this is what happened in the past. But law is necessarily a, a, an ongoing process. No legal system remains the same. 
um, because humans change, our cultures change, our needs change. Uh, and so I think it would be a huge mistake uh, if we did either of the ways, either of the things that you could then do with a machine, either to say, okay, we want a machine to make decisions based on how things have been in the past and just to keep them that way forever. I think most of us would agree that it'd be a silly way to run a legal system, but nor should we give a machine the discretion. You just develop the legal system as you see fit into the future. Uh, I think that would also be a big mistake. So I think those are some of the limitations of AI in the legal system. One great benefit of AI, of computer systems more generally, and this is implicit in your, your reference to the, the sort of um, the, the debugging and design, is at least an AI system, if you ask it if it's biased, if you ask it if it's racist, it will try to give you an honest answer. Uh, and so that is one benefit of AI systems, that, that we can uh, run um, bias detection, we can interrogate them, we can do trial and error by repeating the same decision over and over again with different variables to work out if there is impermissible bias. Uh, whereas in a, in a human judge, for example, or a human legislator or a human employer making a decision, uh, we might ask, are you sexist, racist, and so on, but it'd be very unusual if they gave you an honest answer. So in that sense, I think there is scope for AI to uh, potentially be more honest, uh, but, uh, but not necessarily be more accountable. Thank you so much for all these great conversations and thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm hoping your book will reach out as many as readers possible and your book definitely truly deserves the attention. And I really, really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Michael. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us at the Asian Society of International Law 101 and watch the space for future conversations.